Thank you all for joining us on this webinar. My name is Jamie Shanker Passero, Associate Director at the Temple Small Business Development Center. You are currently all muted and we'd like you to use the chat feature. Today we are again joined by one of our business consultants, John Ondick, who will be answering questions today about setting up your pro formas. This is part two of our two-part webinar on this topic, with today's session really being a Q&A. Hopefully you have all had time to work on your worksheet over the weekend. If you did not attend Friday's session and you reached out to us, you will have received a recording of that session as well as the worksheet. If you have not received that worksheet right now, please email sbdc at temple.edu and I'll type that in the chat. Um, and, and my recommendation is just to follow along as best as you can. Uh, so I will turn it over. I'll stop my screen from sharing and I will let John take over so we can jump in to uh, the Q&A. And I would just suggest jumping into it with your questions and I will help uh, get those questions to John. Great. Thanks, Jamie. Sure. Um, so folks, you should be looking at the same spreadsheet um, that we went over on Friday and I just added a couple of bit more um, uh, entries of, of data uh, so that when I, when I recap again, it, it gives you just a little bit more flavor so you get a sense of, of how the, uh, the formulas in the background are working and what you can do with this. Um, I want to add that um, uh, my colleague uh, Carl Krauss is also uh, on the line here with us today and so uh, between us, we will do our best to, uh, to weigh in um, and, and address whatever questions that you may have uh, about uh, this particular projections tool, um, which for those of you who are new, uh, I, am, I am very high on. It's, it's in all in one sheet and, um, uh, and I think uh, has a lot of power to it. And for those of you who worked through it over the weekend, uh, either about uh, what your experience was doing so, um, or we will also talk about more broadly um, financial projections, going to your bank, um, looking for the disaster loans, et cetera. Okay. And, and John, can you share your screen with us? And I think you, you're going to do a brief recap of what we spoke about on Friday, right? Yeah. Um, I'm sorry, Jamie. I thought I was sharing my screen with you. Oh, it looks like, yep. There yeah. we go. Okay. Wow. Um, got it. You, you seeing it now or oh, not? There, yep. Perfect. Thank okay. you. Well, I'm sorry. Um, no, no worries. Thank you. Okay. So, um, so folks, without any further ado, um, I apologize if you heard this on, uh, on Friday. I know when I learn something, I always pick something else up. Uh, again, even if I've, I've been through it once, but uh, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on the form. Uh, but for um, folks that are new, I'll, I'll basically walk you through the, um, uh, the, the various sections of this tool and um, what I think it can um, uh, help you do for your business when it comes to creating both financial projections um, that you would need to take to a bank for a loan, that you would need to send to uh, the SBA for disaster loans or uh, any of the other various programs, um, governmental or nonprofit uh, that have been popping up uh, and, and expressing an interest to uh, give people loans or, or grants uh, as small business owners in these challenging times, right? So you're gonna need to create some projections and I think this is a great tool to do so. Um, the other thing that I want to stress is, I think beyond a financial projection uh, spreadsheet, this can really become a, uh, an operating tool for your business. Um, the way it is designed, and at least the way that I uh, try to encourage students and, and clients to leverage it, is to really think through all the components of your business and how they're, at, they're going to be impacted by the various conditions out there to drive sales, right? And um, if you look up at the top section uh, in red up here, I've got a note and, uh, and it says that, you know, this enables you to think through the seasonality and cyclicality of your business when you project your sales. And, um, and that means you don't just start uh, like I did in, in uh, unit one up here, which I'll call uh, hot dogs for lack of something better. And, um, fries and uh, drinks, right? Um, and you'll see in unit one here, when I projected the, the uh, sales per month, 
I did what a lot of people do, right? I took this sheet and I started with two and I just kind of increased it kind of linearly and people will, will kind of do this with your business. And, um, and uh, I did similar, but just to a, a higher level in the second uh, line. Um, and what I'm encouraging you to do, again, if you go back up to the note, is not to say, yeah, just kind of straight line growth because that's just almost not going to happen in anyone's business. But to look at things like weather, holidays, the school year, and whether the population is now around for you to sell to or have left, whether that's school uh, age kids, high school age kids, or colleges. Also understand the funding cycle, right? When do people in your industry who can buy from you get their money? Are they driven by the government's fiscal year? Are they driven by the state's fiscal year? Um, if they're a, a B2B sale, when does that company operate? Do they close in June, uh, September 30th, uh, December 31st? And uh, so what's their budgeting cycle like? Because at certain times of year, all of our clients are flush with, with cash because they were just awarded their, their budgets, um, or they're really tight with cash because they spent most of the money that's been allotted to them. So I encourage you to use this tool and look at January, not just as the first month of the year, but as a cold, miserable month very often, where people don't tend to go outside, where people still tend to take in that first week of January a lot of vacation time, where businesses don't necessarily ramp up until sometimes close to, you know, the 10th, 12th, 15th day of the month. So think about it that way um, and then project what happens in your business. In February, do you have an increase or a decrease because of something like Valentine's Day or again because of the weather? Um, spring break and schools go away. You've got Mother's Day. You've got Fourth of July. So all those holidays, um, the various weather implications, uh, funding, school populations, what I didn't talk about uh, on Friday, but are also things like trade shows in your industry, um, big conferences in your industry. Uh, when I was at Aramark, um, I went out to the annual big uh, food show in Chicago, and I met many of our suppliers out there um, who did anywhere from 60 to 85% of their annual sales at this three-day conference, right? So first of all, imagine if your lead salesperson, him or her ends up with, uh, you know, laryngitis that weekend, he can't make it, uh, they got the flu, the conference gets canceled. Imagine the impact, right? So um, trade shows can be very important. Conferences, even big local meetings, can be really important on your sales um, and how they impact your customers, your target market. So all those things should be factored in here uh, as you make your uh, projections. So that's the idea of, of the tool, right? Um, briefly, you know, I've got a hot dog up here. I'm up in the unit section. I sell it for 10 bucks. If I sell two in January, the formula has taken $10 a hot dog times the two hot dogs and come up with $20. So only the units in the sales part here are what you're putting in. Everything else, the machine, if you will, is calculating for you. So if I, I've projected my sales in here for January of my three product types there, here's the sales that I'm making in dollars from those. Here's any cost of goods sold that are coming out. You can see if you're just looking at the tool for the first time, I only put cost of goods sold in one of the uh, units, right? A hot dog I'm selling for 10. I know that it costs me the, the bun, the meat, the packaging, the whole thing. It costs me $5 all in. If you have exactitude around that, you can use this to understand then what your gross profit margin is down here. Um, but what I really encourage folks to do is just say, whatever expenses I have associated with selling these products, find a bucket on this lower half of the form and put it in there somewhere. Take seminars and reclassify that as raw materials, right? Take recruiting and make that packaging or, or whatever you want to do, right? I was supposed to say packaging. 
I don't type very well, sorry. Um, but you get the idea here. I think it makes it nice and neat. You project what it's going to cost you each month to produce as many of these things as you're making, and it's just easier to capture it in one bucket because a lot of people really struggle with cost of goods sold. If you're comfortable with it and you want to put it up here, fine. So just to finish walking through the sheet, I've got the units that I sold. Here's the sales I made from it. Any cost of goods sold expenses were deducted out. Here's my gross profit. And then it adds up here for each month, my total gross profit for the month. All these items at these volumes, at these prices, and this is how much I made. And then you can see it comes over in totals for the year. To give this some, um, some reality, if you'll see in the, method the month of December, I stopped with these little units of sales and I increased them you know, to 130, 2,600. Um, and I did that with a couple of expenses down below as well, just so you start to get out to some uh, larger numbers for your you know, real small business, okay? So here's my gross profit for every the month and for the year. Now we get out to this bottom section. Operating expenses, as I said on Friday, there's a line in here for almost anything that you need. And if not, take it out like I just did with raw materials and packaging and then put your figures in there, right? Um, and that was supposed to be 300. And then of course, just like down below, it totals it for the year, right? These are all the months. And then the uh, worksheet will total all your operating expenses, right? So I've got 100 here, 50 there, and I had another 150 up the top here. So you can see that, the, that it's working. So that's $300 in total expenses. And it leaves me a net, in this case, operating loss of $30 for the month because I only made $270 that month in sales it cost me $300 that month in expenses, so I only had $30 left. Now you can see as we scroll across, I made money in February, lost money a lot of these other months, because why? Because I didn't put any other sales figures in up here, right? So that's what ideally you should be doing. Um, but at the end of the year, um, the spreadsheet took all of my monthly losses and, and profits and it totaled up to the for the year in this scenario i made uh you know profit of twenty nine thousand because of this big month of december so those are the areas of the tool i'm not going to um go into it anymore here's the units where you pick what you're selling and what price here is where you project the sales for the month everything else in here comes out based on the formulas down here is where you project things in and if you're not going to fill all these lines and i encourage you not to for purposes of this tool, put your big expenses in. If you know something for every line, put it in. But if not, make sure you capture the biggies, salaries, rent, potentially office supplies, utilities, the ones that I put in here. And then once you put those expenses in, the worksheet will tally the expenses, it'll total your values for the month and give you a year end projection of having made money or lost money. Okay, so um, I'm gonna jump out of the tool. Carl, anything that you'd like to, uh, to share uh, about the tool, insights, nuances, et cetera, before we do some questions? I think you've basically covered it pretty well, John. Like you said, that the, the key here in the operating expenses is simply to uh, capture the ones that are significant. You don't need to worry about the $2 a month. You'd get, pay your bank for checking account and things like that. Uh, and then carrying them across, just make sure that any of those costs that are monthly costs, that you carry them across through that worksheet so that they total up for the entire year over in the right-hand column there in bold. And what's nice, folks, is just to further cost point one thing, right here I've got office and, and, and um, computer supplies. You might say, geez, I need a new computer for, you know, $1,100. Um, and when you, because of the sales you've projected up top here, when you put that scenario in and you get down here and say, wow, I lost money that month because that's a bad month for me to do it. Then you just say, you know what? I'm not gonna buy that here. I'm gonna hold off, scrabble together as best I can. And I wanna buy it out here in December 
because according to my projections there, I'm making $20,000 that month, right? So I can better afford it. So that's part of the beauty when I say, this isn't just a financial projection tool, but it's an operational tool. Because if you operationalize your sales up top and make realistic projections, then down here you can play with expenses and say, if I have the opportunity to, when am I best prepared to spend certain amounts on consultants or marketing or any other sorts of events, okay? Um, so uh, I did see a chat question in here that says, um, we teach art classes. I'm sorry, Jamie, I'm jumping in saying just so I see it right there, right? But I, it is something I wanted to address. Um, our business is a service business. Is it okay if I only have revenue and operating expenses? Absolutely, folks. And what I often encourage people to do if you have a service business is categorize your units as either an hourly rate, right? Um, I do one massage and I charge, you know, $50 for that hour massage. Or I might have a subscription by the month or by the year where they pay $300 and they can come in as often as they want, right? So hourly tends to be a, a fee for service, a daily rate. The subscription can be what could be um, uh, some sort of bucket of time you sell for people. Um, and then this may just be a per project, right? So um, I also, besides having a monthly subscription, have a annual, you know, program where for $1,000, I give them however many massages you give them a month, whatever. And then you decide down here how many of each of these types of massages or programs I'm going to sell in each of the months, right? So one other way that people will put services in here because it's not exact and most of us in the service business don't have set prices all the time, right? So you may just put here a big project, a medium project, and a small project. Um, or if that doesn't work for you, you can make that a complex project. And for something that's complex, you might charge somebody, you know, $10,000. And for a, um, you know, medium type of project, maybe you bill people $4,000. And then for something that's kind of simple or basic, you know, you may just charge somebody $1,000. The reality is in most of our businesses, you're not going to have a project, complex or not, that's just 10,000 bucks. But if you have a fair amount that are more than that and a fair amount that are less than that, you're kind of ballparking and saying, eh, kind of in the middle for most of my complex projects is 10,000. Most of my medium projects are between like three and five, I'll pick four. Uh, most of my basics, some are little at 500, some are as much as 1300. I'm going to pick a number that's easy to work with, right? So you're kind of weighting the averages of your projects in each of those areas. Um, and this way, it makes the tool workable. If you try to imagine and put a price in here for every type of product you're going to sell in a year, that could be dozens and dozens of different prices, and then you can't use the tool. Okay? All right. So, um, so. Hey, Yes. Um, I just want to get to an earlier question that you sure. missed. Uh, if we are applying to defer loan payments, do we still project them as if they would need to be paid in the projection forecast? If you're applying to defer them, that was the question, right? Yes. So um, my, my answer would be yes, I would put them in because whenever I encourage people, crazy times like this or you know, business as usual, to do financial projections, I always err on the side of financial projections should be conservative so that all surprises are positive surprises. So what I mean by conservative is basically, unless you're really sure about a sale, I don't necessarily include that in, but if I have any chance of having a expense, I do include that in. That way, I've kind of been a little conservative on projecting what my sales will be. They're a little bit lower. I'd be a little bit more aggressive of projecting what my expenses could be. They're a little bit higher. And therefore, 
that should be a mid to worst case scenario because I have all my expenses in, but maybe, maybe not all my sales in. So to answer the question directly, yes, I would project it. Then if the a grant is given so you don't have to pay those expenses, now you make more money in each of those months. If you didn't put them in and you lost it, um, then these projections were going to be overly rosy because you hadn't captured the expense in there, right? So I'd rather have the expense captured and then say, ooh, now I don't have to pay it, then say, I'm probably going to get approved, so I won't put it in, um, and then get a negative, you know, again, what I call a negative surprise, okay? Yeah. Um, okay, so a question, I think, about the unit descriptions. Um, how would I adjust this for jewelry that varies in price point? Do I find an average price point? So in terms of the unit descriptions, cost of goods sold, you have, I think, three um, items there. So for, for businesses who have a lot of them, do you yeah. advise thinking about your bread and butter? What are your three most popular or more of the average? Yes. So two, two answers to that, Jamie. And yes, you're on to it. Um, two, ways to, two ways to do it and work within this three-unit tool. And that is to look, as Jamie said, and as you know about your business, your top three sellers. And if, you know, necklaces, uh, engagement rings, and, and, uh, and some sort of, of brooch or whatever are your top three sellers, um, and you think that, and you know that, they represent, you know, 60, 70% perhaps of all of your sales, then this tool can work. It won't be exact, but you're modeling about 70% of your business. And I think that makes it actionable. You just realize that there's some other sales in there. Um, so your sales will actually be a little bit higher than this comes in. So that's one way to do it. Um, and then the to put the price in, you would take kind of the median point, right? If I've, if I've got engagement means to go from A to B, I kind of take the weighted average and say, you know, on average, it's 600 bucks. I sell some for three and some for a thousand. So um, that's the one answer. The other is to look at your total sales and maybe go back into something that looks more like a big purchase, a small purchase, and a, and a medium purchase, and try to create a hypothetical customer that says, yeah, my average customer spends around $200 if it's a big purchase, $100 on a small purchase, and 20 otherwise. You can make this be customer-centric instead of product-centric, and then you would just project down the bottom roughly how many of each of those customers you get each month. So now you haven't really captured exactly what product they are buying, but you know through the behavior of your business that you have some customers, and the big ones generally spend around 400 bucks in a transaction and somebody else is around two and the lower end are around 50. And that would still give you a pretty good representation of your business, not by product, but by customer. And that should be actionable to create uh, a sales flow. Uh, and then obviously the expenses would be the same down the bottom. So that's my kind of first answer. The second answer is I will send to Jamie and I'm assuming that Jamie, we could probably get it out to folks. Mm -hmm. um, Yep. We also developed a 12 unit spreadsheet that looks just like this. Everything is the same, except there's this place for you to put 12 units. A lot of our restaurant clients and a lot of our, um, honestly, jewelry store clients um, use it. Um, the challenge I always have is 12 gets you more than three, but if you're selling 50, 60, 200 different items, it may not come up with the results that you're looking for. But if you've got, you know, 12 main items make up 90% of what you sell in the restaurant. And remember, you can be creative how you define these units, as long as you know what they stand for. Um, if you have 12 big sellers, and yeah, you might have another 100 items, but that's only 5, 10, 15% of your sales, then you might find this 12 unit tool better. because Everything else works the same way. All you do is put the unit in, the price, any cost of goods sold, and then you project January through December and all the other formulas will work. So if you want some more detail, you'll be able to work from that as well. Some of my retail clients do do that. So I'll send that to Jamie after this call. Yeah, John, that would be great. And then another thought is, would that 
conversation in terms of how to do this when you do have multiple products? And also it may be if you offer both products and services, would that be a good question just to talk individually with the consultants yeah. about? Absolutely. Right. So I feel so like it just varies so much from, from business to business. And folks, this is why Jamie is in the leadership seat and I'm just sitting here along for the ride. Um, <laughs> when we, when I taught this in our workshop, we would spend an entire night on this tool, not going through it because you've already seen it's not that complex. We would literally walk around myself and I would often bring some other colleagues in and walk around the entire um, room to make sure people were real clear on what the unit is they were selling. If they had a mix of goods and services, how they could best capture them in here, how they could get the right weighted average for pricing, et cetera. So defining the unit is really the key for this. Don't make it overly complex, but give it a smell test on the end that says, geez, if I put these things in there, describe them as units, and I price them out accordingly, you know, kind of my thumb up in the wind a little bit because I'm kind of winging it a little, and then I project those units to be sold through these months, take a look and say, is it really representative of my business? Many times the answer will be, yeah, it's close enough to be actionable. Um, and sometimes it'll be, no, you know what? I, I, I'm not comfortable with that second unit and I had to make some changes or geez, maybe a 12 unit one helps with me. So that is an excellent thing to talk with one of your consultants about. If you reach out with us, talk to your business partner about um, if, if you want to do it internally. Uh, but that is a place to spend a lot of time because the rest of the form all really flows from the units. Thanks, Jamie. Yeah, thanks, John. That's great. Um, if you have a customer who has not paid for a product or service that was uh, rendered uh, a few months ago, would, would that still be listed in the month it was provided, even though it was not paid? Yeah, so, so <laughs> yes, because this... Get that person to pay, though, am I right? <laughs> That's right. So, folks, this worksheet... Worksheet. <laughs> been a long, long day. This worksheet does not take into account the timing of money. So it is artificial in the sense of, as you can see, if I sell it in January, I'm making my money in January. I just clicked on here for those who are looking, right? Um, in most of our businesses, many of our businesses, I sell something in January, I may not get paid till February. I have had students who are very, very adept at Excel and wanted this to really be representative of their business, put sales in one month, and then try to predict across their business when they got paid for things in other months, right? 30 days later, net 45, whatever. Um, it really, really can go awry if you're not really on top of it and very comfortable with that. So this does not account for the timing of money. It assumes you get paid in the month that you sell it. If you, in fact, don't get paid by that person at all, um, then you got a problem, as Jamie said, right? Um, you have just projected that you were going to get some money out of that person for this $10,000 complex project, and they didn't pay. There is no way to, on the model, account for not getting paid for it. But what you could do is go down the bottom somewhere. And I think down here we actually have, uh, or used to have a bad debt line that just kind of said, yeah, right here, I expect mm -hmm. in my business to get stiffed occasionally. And I'm going to put some money in here each month, assuming that someone does not pay me. And then at the end of the year, if that money um, did in fact come in, good. I took it out as an expense. I didn't need to when I projected it. And I've now made some more profit than I was counting on, right? So you can't really do it by the transaction, but you could account for if in your business once in a while, one out of 10, one out of 50 people don't pay you, you could, count, you could capture it down here as an expense. The other thing, John, just to interject is sure. to keep in mind when you're looking at this, just from the nature of the question, that this is not a bookkeeping tool. This is a forecasting tool. So this Correct. is a prediction tool, not a way to keep the accounts of your current, yeah, what you're currently doing. Yeah, that is a really good point. 
Okay, I want to go to a next question. Uh, this should be a quick one. Is this document an example of what would actually be submitted to a bank or loan servicer? So, um, great question. I talked about this some on uh, Friday. Um, so, a lot of people will not provide something of this level of detail to their banker um, or their loan person. They will capture by month their sales, their expenses, and what their profit is um, left over, ideally profit left over, and they will not share all of the buckets of expenses in between. So they would basically take the sales numbers up here, right? I've got my total sales. They'll take out their total expenses and that'll leave them as an income or loss for the month um, and, and do it that way. Um, what some people will do is capture maybe their top two or three expenses because for all of our businesses, that tends to be people, real estate and supplies or utilities, insurance and some other things, right? But we tend to know what our big buckets are. So what people will do if they wanna um, show their banker that they have some sense of, I don't just have expenses, I know what the big ones are and I want you to understand that I understand that. They might put in personnel, utilities, um, rent and technology, and they just have a bucket that has other expenses. So that kind of operationalizes it a little bit. Um, if you really, when I, what I do like for people to do, particularly if you have a complex business and if you don't have much of a relationship necessarily with the banker, if you show them something like this, right? What it demonstrates is you have really, really thought through your business. And while no projections are ever accurate, it at least shows the logic that you used as to how you projected sales based on each individual month and then how you are planning for expenses, having really thought through it, right? So you don't need this level of detail, but you could. What I tell clients when, I'm, when they're taking projections to a banker or a loan officer of, of any type is to give them the first year, month by month, sales and expenses, this projection, so that they get to see what your business looks like and you've thought through seasonality, cyclicality, those sorts of things. That they know that May is a strong month for you and November is dead, right? And that they know that you know that about your business. So that's why you're giving them that monthly detail to show them that you understand how your business works month to month. Then in year two, I give quarterly projections of sales, expenses, profit left over for just Q1 through Q4. And then in year three, I just give an annual total or I recommend that people give an annual total that says, here's what my expenses, are, here's what my sales will be in 2022, here's what my expenses will be, and here's what my profit or loss is uh, down the bottom. Um, I do that because I have never seen a financial projection in year two, let alone in year three, that was anywhere near accurate. Um, and so why waste the time to try to really create what is in my simple, humble, one man's opinion, almost impossible to create what my sales look like April, two years from now. But when you look at the year, you have a, t a, a much better chance of being more accurate because now you're projecting on an annual basis, here's what year one looked like, and I really put a lot of thought around that. Here's what you tier, you tier uh, year two looked like quarterly. So if January's a little off, February's a little off, March is a little off, together they kind of baffle that. And then I did to say, after year one and year two, here's what I think the growth of my business is going to continue to look like, um, and now I'm out to year three. So monthly in year one, quarterly year two, annual year three, and if you want to use a tool like this, you can, but it's more detailed than most bankers or loan folks are going to want to see. Okay, thank you. Um, so this is a specific question, somebody who left the chat but is coming back and could apply. Uh, I run events uh, 
large sporting events? Do I project that the event will happen this year? Or do I, if it's happening in August, for example, or do I project if all sports events are canceled until further notice? That's an interesting question. I could see that being applicable to other, um, to other businesses too. If there's, if there's something huge that you usually do uh, that happens in the spring or in the summer, how would you use this tool as if it were happening or as if it were not? That's a hard one. That's a hard one because we just don't know. I'm going to jump out here and say that Carl's crystal ball might be a little better. <laughs> I didn't take the first pass. My crystal ball would be if you're talking August, you've probably, yeah, you can argue that there's a 50 50 chance of that happening. Yeah. Something like that. My somewhat cloudy ball that isn't very crystal y says that if you want to get the loan, the worse it looks, the better. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so right. if you're if you are doubtful of something, I would assume that it's not going to happen. Right. Or do a do a version with it happening and without right. and right. then put in the basically an explanation of this is the best chance best case, worst case, and the best case is only about a thirty or forty percent chance of actually happening. The worst case is more like a 60, 70% chance. Because it just so needs to make sense to another human. It has to make sense to a human, which is the, per the, the, the lending yeah. specialist that's looking at it. And they don't know when this is going to be over yeah. either. They're perfectly clear that everybody's just in the dark right now. They're yeah. doing the best job they can do as well. So if you can explain things clearly, and that's true about anything with this application, if you can explain things clearly and it makes sense, they're going to listen. Uh, quick question, I think just about the worksheet and its edit, editability. Um, can can, can uh, somebody who we've sent this to add more unit rows um, so that they can calculate below accordingly or would that maybe mess up the... No, uh, I, I have had many students over the year. In fact, we got to the 12 unit one um, years ago because a student in my class built it because three didn't work for his business, but 12 did. Okay. Um, and then we started teaching it thereafter. So if you are comfortable with Excel, this is pretty basic. You add some rows in under the units um, and you then add them in under sales. And then the formulas will copy and paste down through all the other stuff. So certainly feel free. What most people do when they send these back to me is just to make it more um, readable. Um, and I encourage them to do that. They go down to the expense area and they wipe out a lot of the expenses that they don't expect to ever have. They put a couple miscellaneous ins for placeholders and they take these, this 40 some lines and break it down to 15 or 18 lines um, so that it just looks easier and it's, um, I mean, it looks clear and it's easier to work through. But yes, if you're good with Excel, you can, uh, there's no, um, what, what do you call here? Pride of authorship. Uh, do with this with whatever will benefit you. I think okay. the caveat there, John, is you must be good with Excel and know what you're doing with changing yeah. those formulas and copying things in and that type of thing. Absolutely right. And, and, and folks, you know who you are. I've had a career of telling people, don't let the MBA in finance from the Wharton, fool, Wharton, Wharton School fool you. I never modify this because I couldn't have built it in the first place. <laughs> Um, I think you might have answered this on Friday, uh, but, but for the people who are just joining us, uh, if you're applying for an SBA loan, would that be part of the P&L projection? So it certainly would be for me. The only thing I'm not sure, and I, what, you're going to have to take these numbers. Um, now, like, hold on, let me step back, Jamie. Like a traditional SBA loan or these disaster things we're talking about right now? I'm guessing disaster. Got it. Um, okay. But that person can always tune in and tell me if they're thinking otherwise. Got it. Because the disaster loans have an online application um, and uh, you're going to probably end up taking the numbers from this exercise and putting them into the form. If you submit, if you're talking about submitting just for an SBA loan, um, then absolutely. I've had many people submit this as a financial projection 
because you really build your loan package. They tell you what they want in it, but you build it and give it to them. One, one caveat there again, John. Certainly, is Carl. That if you're using these projections to apply for a loan, number one, your loan, the SBA loan, would not be included in this because that is not an expense on the, or an income on the income and expense. That's a cash, that's an investment issue that's in your cash, but not in this form here. So normally what they would do is you would just go ahead and do your, your expenses and your income, your sales, the way this is done, and then go all the way down to the bottom line where it has your net income. And I think in this case, John, you show uh, losses. Can you scroll down there? Yep, sure can. Um, so yes, the way this is set up, um, it demonstrates, it shows out as losses just because I just plugged in some stuff, but yeah. Right, which is fine, which is good. Yeah. So, so you'll see losses here. And then what they will look at is when you sum up the losses, if this is actually a loss, then it's a $1.3 million, $1 million loss. Um, if that's the case, then you're asking for $1.3 million to cover that loss. So your loan, this would help to justify a $1.3 million loan to support the losses so that you have the cash to pay these expenses while you're under lower sales numbers than what you would normally have. And, and, and just to, to um, jump on to what Carl said and related back to what he actually said earlier, right? Part of what I like, folks, about this tool, you've already heard me talk about the seasonality, cyclicality piece up top when we're projecting the sales, and then down here when we're projecting the expenses is, it empowers you to tell the story of your business and get the idea across that is beyond the numbers, right? You just send somebody something that shows, I'm making this much money, they make a numbers only based decision. They make that based on as much detail as you've been able to give them. If you can show them, I know how my business looks. I spend money on this. I don't spend money on this. I spend money in the summer when I'm fat with cash. I hoard it in the winter time. The logic that is baked into this is much more robust than is in most people's basic P&L that says, here's what I made. Here's what it cost me. Here's what's left over. So if you have to persuade someone to give you a loan or give you a grant, much of that is baked into the logic and the, the insights of your business you put into creating these numbers. And it will let you tell a much better story because to me, the story is what comes down to most funding things, right? So uh, most of those Ideally, you want to get to a conversation with somebody. With these SBA loans, there isn't going to be any conversation that I'm aware of. You want to fill out the application and send it in. But in most cases, your banker, your nonprofit, your investor, you're going to get a chance to sit with them, and this can really help you put your best foot forward. Whether you're demonstrating profit to earn a loan, or to Carl's point, you're demonstrating losses and why you have those losses and how you're going to recover from those losses for someone you're trying to get a disaster loan or a grant from. Okay, there was a, there was a recent question um, from someone who submitted an SBA disaster loan asking how long they're taking to get back to applicants. Uh, if I recall from the webinar we ran last week, a representative from our local SBA office, I think she said two to three weeks, um, but we, there's a link to that webinar um, in our research page that will be sent out to all of you. Yeah, and yes, I think okay. in there, Jamie, she did say, I think she said, you know, people are saying two to three weeks. Yeah, it looks like two to three, yeah. Getting I would think like 30 days, right? Again, being conservative. Um, and she also did say that um, some of the onus on this was with the applicants because after they award you the loan, you've got to get the closing documents back to them to accept it. Um, 
And her prior exp experience was that sometimes people take a while to get those documents back to them. So that some of that time frame is going to be on you. So the lesson there, folks, is the day you get whatever you get from them, get it right back in. That puts you at the top of the queue. Okay. Um, I'm trying to see if there are any more questions. I think we may have answered all of them. And Jamie, if that's the case, I'm just going to do one thing I did not do on Friday, but this is a bonus for the Friday folks who might have come back and listened through this again. Mm -hmm. um, so I want to go to, there's, there's one more um, tab down the bottom that we didn't go through. This, the second tab here is just a list of these operating expenses, right? You don't need that, but we created one back when for people to want to go through expense creation exercises and not worry about the top part of the form. So, you know, this first tab is the whole thing we've been looking at. Second tab is just a, a compilation of the expenses again. There's a direct marketing thing here that I just want to throw out to folks that, that we're not, we didn't go through in the seminar, um, but it gives you a nice little framework to look at and say, man, if my advertising budget is this much and pay-per-click cost me this much, then what you know, how many visits does it get? What's my conversion rate come in? So you get to put in the pieces that are in yellow. The other numbers are stuff that is fixed based on whatever your campaign is, web advertising or direct mail. And it gives you a way to play with and say, you know, what's the cost to get me to get a customer? And is it really worth putting maybe $1,000 into the web when instead I could do direct mail or vice versa? So there's a a little algorithm that uh, a friend of mine who's a marketing person taught in the class one time. Um, and, uh, and then there's another one in the back that talks about churn. If you know you lose so many of your customers each year, you can um, use this spreadsheet to say, to make my projections, I have to have so many new customers each month. I anticipate having that many. And I also expect to have so many current customers continue to be customers this month. It takes a little bit of logic around your business, but if you think that way, that geez, I have so many repeat customers and so many customers that are new to me the first time, this is a way to kind of help you flesh out some of the logic around um, that tool there. So just want to touch on those other couple tabs. I do not go through them in this workshop that, uh, that I used to teach with this, uh, but some folks did find it valuable to themselves. Um, when they were thinking about their businesses. Sure. Um, and then somebody from Friday was asking, uh, was mentioning that we spoke about adding loan repayments to the expense section and just wanted clarity if that was still the case. So I think what Carl said, which is true, is what you would generally put down here. Yes, if you're going to get a loan and you know this six months out or three months out, you're going to start paying it back you should account for those loan expenses in those months, but you're not paying the principal of the loan back unless you are. If you're just paying interest, then you would just put the amount of the interest that you're going to be paying each month on. And, and just to clarify, even if you are paying principal, only the interest should go in this sheet. The principal would come out of what's left over down at the bottom of your sheet there under uh, net income. So you'd want to make sure that you have sufficient net income to be able to pay your principal payments as well, but they are not considered an expense by accounting standards. Um, and so I, I, I get, the, I agree with what Carl just said there. If you are looking at this as a cash flow tool, you could in fact have the principal payments up here. Right. right in the loan payment but the bottom line is if you're only going to have the interest here like carl said you got to have a line somewhere down here even if the, even if you don't have the line that says geez my principal is five grand a month i better have profit to pay that right so somewhere you would incorporate that if you're looking at cash flow on this tool versus just the straight accounting treatment of it um 
Okay. I think this, this maybe will be our last question. Um, on the disaster loan application, it asks for a schedule of liabilities. Should that tie to the tax return uploaded, which in this case for this particular business would be 2018, or should it come from the financial statements, which would be from 2019 for this business? So um, <laughs> my answer, if I'm sitting on the other end, I want your most current schedule of liabilities. Um, I, I want them now. So um, if you are applying right now, I would list, because I looked at the form, what your liabilities are right at this point in time. Because if you give them the ones from 2018 or even the ones from 2019, they see those already. But those liabilities could well have changed over the first three months of 2020, particularly given what has happened to all of our businesses in the past month or so. So um, however you document your current liability, stuff you owe to people, um, I would use the most current documented month, whether it's what they look like at the end of January or at the end of February, or even real time at the end of today, if you know what those balances are. Okay. Um, and there was a question about the disaster loan wanting to link to it. So I'm going to copy and paste that right now. Just give me a moment. And one thing to add to that, Jamie, while you're posting that. Yeah, sure. Is a reminder to everyone that's online here or maybe new people that have joined us today that the consultants at the SVDC at Temple have been trained by the SBA uh, officers to loan officers to help you with uh, completing this application to make sure that it's done correctly the first time. And so we are available if you want to avail yourself of the consulting services and those are at no cost to small businesses in Pennsylvania. And and to, and to Carl's point, and all of you are concerned, because all of you took the time, some of you to, to listen into this on Friday and again today, um, it's a big world of resources out there, folks. And um, as Carl shared, the, the Temple SBDC folks have been trained up uh, in walking through this application. Um, this application is not the end all be all of what is out there. And um, SCORE's website, uh, our partners uh, under SBA service providers, um, SBA's website, the Pennsylvania DCED, Department of Commerce and Economic Development, um, all are very target rich environments. You can't be on the page for more than five seconds without seeing coronavirus resources. Um, and it talks about a lot of things in a way of besides these SBA disaster loans, um, other organizations that are looking at zero interest loans, low interest loans or grants. It also talks about a lot of other sorts of things um, that can help you and your business at these times besides just this funding financing piece. So um, a little bit of, uh, of Googling, uh, I highly recommend the SBA site, the SCORE site, um, John, John, so I actually just sent to everybody a link of our working uh, resource list for small businesses, our Google Doc. Mm -hmm. So we have links to FEMA, we have links to the SBA, to SCORE, webinars, um, other webinars that other uh, SBDCs are doing. There's a lot in there. Uh, Jamie, is that on our website as well? It is on our website. Yep, it's on the homepage right now. Got it. That's the one I went up. Okay, great. Super. So there you go. And I knew we were a red, red resource as well. So. Yes. And that is what is on the screen right now. Yep. Yep. Right. Yeah. yeah. So we try, we're just trying, we're updating this constantly. Um, so that's something that you can all have access to. So I think I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Yep. So again, if that's good. Right. folks, I know Jamie's screen sharing. Um, my, my sincere um, hope is that uh, Friday and again today, uh, you found this, this worthwhile, um, that you will think through projection, you know, financial projections for your businesses, maybe in a little bit different way than you did before and, and see how it can really 
the financials are representative of your true operations of your business on an annual basis. Um, and that will serve, uh, I think, you well, has served many clients well. Um, beyond this craziness we find ourselves in, um, stick to a lot of creativity, um, and, um, and hopefully we all get through this. And I want to thank um, Carl for, um, I'd ask if he could kind of jump in uh, today, and, and I appreciate your insights too, Carl. Yeah, so this is good because we, we it's 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 uh, the hour now, so perfect time for wrapping up. We really really appreciate you doing this again with us, John. Um, I wanted to mention really important uh, before I talk a little bit little bit more about the SBDC in general. I wanted to mention that I'm hoping that all of you small businesses who have their business located in Philadelphia have heard the announcement from Commerce today. Commerce and PIDC have developed a loan relief package specifically for Philadelphia businesses, for, um, for small businesses with under 500,000 in revenue, $5,000 grants are going to be available. If you have a larger business with more revenue, there are other, uh, there are other offerings, including zero interest loans up to $100,000. So I'm hoping that you all saw that announcement. Um, the application, uh, I'm not sure if it's been posted on Commerce's website yet. I'm guessing it has been. It is pretty user-friendly. They will ask to, to have your, your financials and other documents in order, some tax returns. Um, that is also something that our consultants can assist with, but really did not want to leave this webinar without mentioning it. What you're seeing on the screen right now is just a roundup of our services since we are getting a lot of new businesses coming to us who may not have heard about us and what we do. So we are part of the Fox Business School, part of Temple University. We've been around uh, for over 30 years. We're one of 16 SBDCs in Pennsylvania and we're here to help small businesses start and grow. And we do this with our no cost one-on-one -on -one consulting and we're funded from the government in order to do that. Uh, we also have education programs, which include business planning classes, and normally we do in-person events, and now we're obviously switching to webinars, and we're trying to um, bring in resource partners who can talk specifically on, on the impact of the coronavirus on your business right now. Um, there will be a survey uh, that we will email to you. Uh, this is just a requirement since we are funded by the government. There is also a survey going around that the Commerce Department puts out. It is still open just to find out a little bit more about your needs as a small business owner. Um, so I would recommend filling that out. Visit Philly is also doing um, a survey to, to find out your story, find out the impact on businesses, and they may be sharing individual stories. I'm not sure exactly where that'll go, uh, but it's always good to have your voice heard. Uh, these are these are a few bullets from that resource list that I just sent out. Um, if you had been a, a client of ours and you had signed up for any of our upcoming events, obviously they are postponed. Um, but we do have some upcoming webinars. We have a webinar on Wednesday where we will be bringing in some other lenders. Um, Work and Honeycomb will talk about their services available to small businesses. We may at this point be getting a representative from Commerce as well to talk about um, their relief their relief program that they just announced today. Uh, on the seventh, we'll be talking about social media and customer relations as it relates to this experience and connecting uh, with your customers differently. Also, look out for a webinar or possibly a series of webinars, most likely next Monday will be the first one. Uh, we just put this together today uh, that will specifically focus on the hospitality industry. So events, restaurants, um, things like that. So look out for that. We'll make sure that all of you are on our newsletter so you can find out that information. Uh, question about applying for grants as a new business. It really depends on what you're looking for. Um, or, or you're talking specifically about the commerce grant. That's a good question. I am not sure. They may have a requirement about how many years in business you are. I didn't hear about that on the I'm webinar. Sorry, Do you remember hearing that, Carl? 
Yeah, Jamie, this morning in our uh, session they mention that? commerce, they said that um, they they would like to, or they're, they're one of the criteria, how did they word it? It's not criteria. It's one of the things they will look at is length and business, but that new businesses are eligible, but they have limited amounts of money. So they'll be using different criteria to determine them. When okay. The criteria yeah. Length and and to, but certainly and to, it's, worth, it's worth applying. Even right. Business. And to add some of the other criteria that they will look at is if you can show a loss from uh, coronavirus and also that you have employees, they really are looking to make the largest economic impact possible. So uh, solo entrepreneurs are probably not likely to qualify. So I wanted to add that too. Uh, what you have in front of your screen now is our contact information. Um, we are all working remotely. If you are interested in connecting with a consultant, that email on the screen, and I also put it in the chat, is the best way to request that. And uh, the individual emails for uh, myself and John are in there as well. Um, somebody, someone raised their hand. Do you want to type your question in the chat? Okay. Well, please feel free to reach out to us for, with your individual concerns. We are here to support you however possible. Keep checking back in um, if you're interested in more of these webinars that we're doing. And we will be emailing this recording um, and some of the resources that we mentioned to you afterwards. And in return, we ask that you please complete that survey for us. Uh, so thank you for tuning in and um, good luck with everything. Please, please keep us in mind as a resource to help you as, um, as you navigate this, this situation. And folks, when, when Jamie says complete the survey, please be as, uh, as honest and, and <laughs> transparent as you can. If, if you loved it and it was worthwhile, tell us that. If you didn't like it and you wanted something else or more, please tell us that as well because we, we do go through those. We do try to improve these sorts of, of um, presentations every single time we deliver them. So we take your feedback very seriously, good, bad, and ugly. And definitely, definitely, if you have ideas for other topics that you'd like to hear from, that's great for us to hear as well. Good catch. Okay. Thanks again. Good luck, folks. Thanks, Thanks Jamie. Thanks, Carl.